broadcasting under the night sky from the edge of an undisclosed jungle on the Gulf of Mexico. I'm Christopher Garitano, your voice in the night. For the next hour, allow me to be your guide into the bizarre unknown, the fantastic macabre, and together we'll journey to that borderland between fiction and reality, a place beyond all rational explanation. We are now off to the witch. It had blue flashing lashes. It was, you know, approaching the ground, but then they went out. And when the opening appeared, some source of light came from the inside. It was just almost blinding. Sheriff Diamond, can you tell me just what happened that night? No, sir, I can't. All I can tell you is there was two men came into the Sheriff's Department approximately 8.30 and 9 o'clock. They were all excited and upset. Wanting to climb the walls. Hysterical, crying. That's actually all I know is what happened. As far as we see it, what happened, I don't know. That was an interview with a man who claims to have been abducted by UFO-related extraterrestrials in 1975. Claims like this one have been under examination and scrutiny in modern culture for nearly a century. In many cases, the yarns of bizarre visitors have ultimately been declared as a hoax. The witnesses to the phenomena risk their reputations despite zero benefit of fame and fortune. Tonight, we speak with a man who not only maintains that he was visited by beings from cosmic realms unknown, but has a strong theory of their origins that relates to the oldest concepts of evil. Stay tuned, and I'll return after this commercial break. After these messages, we'll be right back. Roswell, New Mexico, in 1947. This local rancher just brought in a whole lot of, I don't know what you'd call it, but he claims it all came down at his place, and the sheriff thinks it might be something you guys sent up. Our government encountered something. Some, you know, top secret. Beyond our capacity to understand. Couldn't have been anything of ours. I mean, how in the hell was that thing held together? Look at this. A power so terrifying. It's as light as a feather. I mean, what the hell are we dealing with here? Is it friendly? Is it hostile? A secret so dangerous. From now on, you're not to talk to anyone about this. That includes your family. That ranger was threatened. The sheriff was threatened. They threatened me. What the hell is this? It could forever change the world as we know it. What if people think that we are not in control of the skies? They'd be right. Nobody is going to take you seriously, not without proof. Now, it's time you heard the truth. I saw the bodies. My bodies. Now, at last, you will believe. You may be the first person in human history ever to see writing from another world. It was a lie. It was a lie. I know what I saw, and it is not from this world. You have nothing. Martin Sheen. Kyle McLaughlin. Roswell. Welcome back to Off to the Witch. I'm your host, Christopher Garitano, and tonight's guest is one of the many throughout history that claim to have been abducted by beings from another world. Richard Price suggests that when he was an 11-year-old boy in the 1970s, he was not only visited by intelligent beings from realms unknown, but he strongly believes that they are from an alternate dimension, one that was translated into biblical tomes as a literal hell. I think it's best to allow him to tell his own tale. So here's my interview with Richard Price. Springerville, Arizona in 1968, February. 
And in Springerville, Arizona, in 1968, were you aware of any kind of UFO sightings? or Because that's a hot spot, right? Well, remember one thing. I was just born in 68, so I wouldn't know anything. I wouldn't recollect anything at that point. But my father is a Roswell UFO witness. Oh, wow. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Because I'm sure he talked about it somewhat when um, when you were growing up, no? No, he waited till I was an adult and then told me about it. The ironic part was is that we had weird UFO encounters, you know, all my life. We had a close encounter in Conroe, Texas, uh, within three months of the uh, Cash uh, Landrum incident. Okay, can you take me back there? Tell me a little bit about the Cash Landrum incident for the people that don't know. And take me back to the moment of this encounter because I, you know, it's an audible experience. I have no visuals and I, I want you to describe it if you could take me back even emotionally where you were, what was happening, what what it was like that night before things changed. Well, Back in 1978, uh, and ours happened before the Cash Landrum incident, where uh, two win- women, and I forget their first names, and, their, and one of the women's grandsons, I should say grandson, um, were driving down the road, uh, back road in Conroe, and they saw what looked like a triangular-shaped object, or a diamond-shaped object. Forgive me. But the uh, thing is, is that it was glowing really bright. And they pulled over to get a better look. And the little boy jumped out of the car. His grandmother went went with him. And the other lady uh, stayed in the car. But they noticed that they were getting burns. And that soon, and it was dropping slag or whatever, if I'm correct, off of the vehicle and onto the ground. And that the heat was so intense that it started melting the plastic inside their car and the um, tires. Wow. And they were taken to the hospital soon after that with radiation poisoning. They sued the U.S. government. And the case got tossed out of the, uh, out of court. But my incident, or my family's incident, happened three months prior to that. And we were on our, on our way home from church that night. It was a Sunday night. And it was just that it was not necessarily at uh, evening, but it was at dawn or at, at dusk. Right there, right before it turned evening. And I saw what looked to me originally as a light, a big orb in the sky that I thought was the moon. But then I started looking at it and there were no features. It was just plain white. As soon as I started noticing that and pointing it out to my siblings and my father, the thing started zigzagging back and forth. And then as we were getting closer to, to the house, it turned, for, it changed colors from white to a yellowish color, no, to a blue color, to a yellow, to a yellowish color, and then to a fiery red as it settled about 20, I'd say about 15 to 20 feet above the uh, roof of the um, trailer house we lived in. Well, that's and just- when you were seeing this, were you aware of UFOs at that time? Were you experiencing anything on television or in movies that have already kind of solidified that in your imagination? Uh, that's a good question. And I used to read up on UFOs. I was a big space uh, cadet. When I was younger, I wanted to be an astronaut. And, you know, even fringe science uh, interested me. And I uh, knew about UFOs, read books on them. So when this was happening in the heat of the moment, did it occur to you at this point that this was a UFO, this thing that was hovering above your house? 
Well, yeah, it did. And then here's another strange part about that. Is that I kept seeing kind of flash visions inside the um, trailer house. Of these little beings. Chasing my family back and forth. Wow, what did they look like? Typical gray aliens. But they they didn't bother me, but they actually went after my father and my siblings and my stepmother. Why they didn't go after me is <laughs> something I still do, uh, don't have an answer for. You know, I mean, um, they went after ev- uh, everybody else but me. What happened when they approached your family? What were they doing? They were trying to lead my siblings off outside. They'd ran inside the uh, trailer and then they tried to uh, lure, lure them outside. My dad happened to be outside staring at that thing. And I came inside to, <laughs> because with all the stories I've read about alien abductions, even when I was a kid, you know, the Betty and Barney Hill story and all. Oh, yes. I then realized this, that this is a potential abduction uh, scenario, and I was about roughly about 11 years old, 10 or 11 at that time. And I realized at that point in time, Chris, that we may be looking at a potential abduction. You must have been terrified. Honestly, I wasn't. That kind of thing never scared me. But at the time, you know, I'm a meta genius. I um, have had my IQ tested between 163 and 200. So oh boy. I've looked at these things and I had a, I had a uh, background or baseline knowledge uh, as to what was going on. And all I did is I said, I will not fear. I will not cave in to my fear. I will go ahead and I will tell them if they try to come after me, uh, basically to get the heck out out of here and leave me alone. Was your family terrified of what was happening? The ironic part is uh, they don't remember. My dad cannot recollect what, if anything, their memories were wiped, and I remember it like it was yesterday. So you were 11 years old. This incredible experience uh, was shared amongst you and your family. How? What was the height of the experience? So you're in the trailer house. The ship is hovering above the house. Your father's outside. Family's inside. And now these beings are in with you. What happened next? The thing actually, um, they disappeared. The thing actually flew up uh, vertically and disappeared. I mean, it just shot up and then bam, it was gone. So there was some kind, it it was almost a chaotic situation, no? Because you had all of this activity happening. Did it feel like time slowed down while all of this? I mean, in your memory, how how do you see it? You know, because you're inside the house these beings are in with you and they're approaching your family they were shifting in and out of dimensional space okay okay i could see them but it was like a uh, a ghost image if you know what i'm talking about i can imagine okay while they were uh, interacting with my siblings and my stepmother and my dad what were they doing what were the beings doing with your family? Well, they were trying to drag them outside, but every time I would see them try to drag them out, they would, pardon me, simultaneously disappear and then reappear again. Wow. Still trying to take them outside. And it was like I was there, but not there, if you know what I'm talking about. Sure. I mean, would it be the equivalent to almost being uh, sedated in a way or a dreamlike experience? No, I was fully cognizant as to what was going on. 
But there was shifting uh, in that time, shifting between parallel dimensional space. And did, did you understand that was happening when you were 11? Or it's, it's looking back in hindsight that now you can identify No, I understood that. that back when I was 11. Oh, okay. Wow. That's amazing. And so the night ends. The ship abruptly disappears. What happened the next day? Or even further in that night, do you remember what happened after? I went to bed and went... I went to bed, my brothers and I shared a, or my brother and I shared a bed, and so did my sisters, and um, went to sleep the next morning, we got up, and and pretty much it was like nothing happened, you know. Did anyone, did you try to discuss this with anybody in the family the next day, or anyone else? Uh, Yeah, I did. Can you tell me about that? My siblings remembered it at the time. They, and they made a comment. They go, "Whatever, uh, what was that big red ball?" And how how old were your siblings at the time? Were they younger or older? Or, or I have both? two older sisters. One was born in sixty four. The other one was born in sixty five. I was born in sixty eight. My younger brother was born in seventy, and in seventy two, my youngest sister. So your older sisters were in their teens at that time. Correct. Um, and did they, they remembered what happened? Well, I know that my sister Teresa remembers, and I do believe Jackie, my oldest sister, remembered. Um, my younger siblings, Robert or Bobby and Melissa, I do not believe that they knew or re- remembered uh, what happened because they they were quite young at that time, seven and eight. But uh, my dad, strangely enough, doesn't remember what happened. But he believes that it happened? Well, he won't say that it does or doesn't because he doesn't remember. Right. Now, you had mentioned your dad was a a Roswell witness. He had that as a precursor to this experience. Can you tell me, and he told you much later when you were an adult, uh, did he bring up this experience when he ultimately told you about the Roswell No, we were watching, uh, it was about 1990, I do believe, 90 or 94. And I happened to be watching the Roswell um, alien autopsy video. And they were showing um, a montage of uh, photos of the Roswell Army Airfield and old Roswell from back in the 40s. And my father came to me and said, Rick, is this Roswell? And I go, yeah. He goes, you know, I was there. And I go, what do you mean? I was there at the crash site. And I go, no, I didn't know. And I kind of was skeptical because I'm going, yeah, sure, Dad. Yeah. My dad has had at times a uh, tendency to kind of, tell really tall tales. So when I heard him say that, I'm going, yeah, okay, whatever. Until he went to my uncle, my late uncle Marshall, and said, Marshall, tell this boy about that, about the Roswell stuff I got. And my uncle looked at him and said, yeah, Paul, what happened to that stuff? And the way my uncle answered it was with a question, you know, and I went, I guess he wasn't pulling my chain. And wow. so it kind of it kind of led from that point on to about an over 30 year um, investigation on the incident and on my father and my uncle El- Elwood's involvement in the uh, incident. You must have been astonished at that point, though, because now by 94, you've had a, a, a life full of interest. You had this experience, and we haven't even talked about what happened between then. Were you astonished when your father told you this? Well, like I said, initially I was skeptical. I mean, I, when, when somebody comes and tells you that they 
picked up Roswell debris. Um, and it's the first time he's ever told you that. You're going to be thinking, yeah, Dad, okay, whatever. Until when my uncle verified it, and then later on my late Aunt Connie verified it, I realized, okay, there was truth to this. So and, once again, when your dad was there, in what position did he have where he was observing the debris itself? Okay, my dad was born in 1939. When the incident, occur incident occurred, he was eight years old. Eight, okay. He went with my uncle, Elwood, who was a uh, uh, naval veteran, fought in uh, Normandy in World War II. And at the time, when he came back, he was a war hero. And one of the radar operators at the Roswell Army Airfield Okay, and I want to make sure I'm having some difficulty with my uh, computer. Can you still hear me? Oh, I can. Yeah, I'm just listening. I'm, okay. I'm compelled by the story. Well, what happened was, you know, if you hear the story about the Roswell, uh, the Roswell UFO um, crash, they have left a crap ton of information out. And they have embellish things and for and not acknowledged certain things that would actually show some facts that a lot of people including uh, Walter Hout's daughter Julie Schuster who's now deceased didn't want people knowing about the fact that her father and uh, Jesse Morcell senior had al had already been notified the night before the impact occurred that the Roswell Army Airfield radar operators tracked a, uh, two fast walkers. And for the people out there who don't know what a fast walker is, it was an old statement or an old term uh, that was made, pardon me, during World War II and the early 50s onto on uh, the 1970s of radar blips that would go across um, the um, the radar screen at a high rate of speed, higher than what was uh, readily achieved at that point in time with technology. Well, how my father got involved in this was that my uncle Elwood knew a radar operator, and he was friends with him at Roswell Army Airfield, and the guy said the night before my dad and my uncle went out there, he called my uh, uncle and said, gave him the coordinates and said, get out there, get out there before the army cordons off the area. We, we tracked both of these objects to their impact points. So the very next Sunday, they went to church and then right after church, my uncle Elwood took my father with him and they went out to the secondary impact site at, I do believe, the Plains of San Augusta. Which, by the way, if you know anything about the history, uh, the history of radio astronomy, is where they located the very large array tele, tel, uh, a radio telescope array. It was right there at the impact point of the Roswell uh, UFO. Okay, and a lot of people don't know that, but I think really the honest truth of the matter is that they're hoping that if there's another, the U.S. government that is, is hoping that if there's another interaction with the so-called ETs, they put the radar uh, in, or the uh, radio antennas there so that way they could communicate with any other uh, vehicle that might come in. Do you believe that the U.S. government was aware of UFOs before the Roswell crash? Well, let's go back to 1941. Um, the battle for, La for Los Angeles incident. Right after World War II in January, um, or right after uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. 
And in 1941, there um, was, I, I don't know if I would call it radar, but there was a detection of an unknown object flying into California. And that a battery of um, artillery shells were fired at it. One crashed off the uh, coast of San, um, Santa uh, mm, Catalina Island. And the other one flew away. Reportedly, at that point in time, they retrieved the craft and its dead occupants. Now, this predates the Roswell incident by seven years. You right. ask a question, do you think that we knew that the government knew about it? Absolutely. Roswell was not the first. What, in, in, on record, and I was aware of the Battle of Los Angeles, but some of our listeners are not, and I wanted them to have this in perspective, uh, that these things were occurring well before, I mean, perhaps even in, you know, biblical times. But what was in modern times, let's say 20th century, what was the very first report in the 20th century? Well, we could go back to the late 1800s, if you want to go back that far. Sure. Yeah, just a little history on this, and then I want to move forward in your experience personally. But yes, definitely. Um, we're talking about the great airship flak, where these airships were flying into the United States, the mid-southwest and all, landing, and reportedly humanoid, human-like uh, beings came out and walked amongst uh, the people, and then flew off. Up until modern modern times, there were incidences in China that were observed, Japan, all over the uh, southwest of the United States. There there were these glowing orbs, uh, in, especially in in an area of Texas. New Mexico is another was another hotbed of uh, frequent uh, unidentified sightings, and this predates all all of this predates uh, World War II and Roswell by at least twenty years. So, do you believe that these ships, this this these type of craft, do you believe that whatever these things are, have been visiting us? much longer than people realize. I do, but here's my viewpoint about them. Now, I want to tell the uh, audience that I am a, I am a Christian, so I kind of look through the lens of my faith. I believe that this technology or pseudo-technology we're looking at may be more interdimensional in nature than even extraterrestrial. I believe that what we are looking at is a potential demonic influence. And when you say demonic and it's interdimensional, is it what has been identified as demonic for so long? Um, if you could further define that for me. Well, for example... Occultist uh, Marvel Whitesides Parsons and his sidekick, L. Ron Hubbard, and yes, the founder of Scientology, were both um, students of Aleister Crowley. They were working in the 40s before Area 51 was ever brought into existence on a sex magic, and that's magic with a K, not a C, ritual called Babylon working, where they thought, uh, Chris, that they could bring down Lucifer in the form of a child, the Antichrist. And the, and this theory or these ideas, that was all derived from Aleister Crowley? 
from um, Jack Parsons or Marvel Whiteside's Parsons uh, studies of uh, the Talmud and several other uh, writings of uh, Aleister Crowley. And here's here's the thing. Let me bring this up. Reportedly, the uh, Babylon working ritual was meant to open up or tear open a rift in time space, allowing for demonic entities from the neither regions of hell to infiltrate themselves into our space time. And the ironic thing is, if you look at the in- increase of UFO sightings. After 1945, they they spiked. And it, it is my opinion that the reason for the increase of uh, in UFO sightings is because the Babylon working ritual worked. And what we're looking at right now with UFO experiences was a was derived from that quote grand experiment by both um, Jack Parsons and Hubbard. So, do you believe the craft and the beings within that visited you or attempted to abduct your family, or perhaps even did when you were eleven, fall under the category of demon? Either demon or another way to put it, daemon. So in other words, this is a complicated conversation. So these beings from other worlds that are flying through ours with their technology, and this could be completely other dimensions, not necessarily other planets within our galaxies um, or our solar system, are of what we could define evil in nature because perhaps they don't uh they don't have any conscious um or conscience sorry they have no conscience about what they're doing they'll abduct us they'll kill us even experiment with us i need a little bit more um i'd like to know a little bit more about what you feel their purpose is what their perspective is and why exactly and I, um, why exactly they fall under the category of evil or demonic? They're, they are not necessarily independent entities that have control over what they do. There is a larger compelling force that is actually writing the rules for them that they follow. And the thing is, when you, to go back, and I hope you don't mind me breaking up, um, you know, uh, uh, the idea from the Bible about the fall of man. And I, I don't mind. I'm here to, to learn about your particular perspective, and it's a unique one. And um, so please tell me what's on your mind. Well, we're going back to uh, the stories in the Bible dealing with the fall of the angels under Lucifer, the light bringer, the light bearer. And Lucifer was, in all the biblical writings, and even in some esoteric writings as well, was the most perfect cherub that Yahweh created. He was a musician. He was the most beautiful Cherub or angel, if you want to use that term. But then he got proud. It's not that he felt that he uh, was better than God or Yahweh. He felt that he, because he was so awesome, that he was equal to that of his creator. And that... And that pride caused a rift between him and his creator, which led to a war in the in the heavenly uh, in heaven between force the forces that were siding with Yahweh 
and the angelic forces that were uh, co-opted and corrupted by Lucifer. The suspenseful and the terrifying comes a new classic, The Fury. The Fury is the power that holds the key to all power. 20th Century Fox presents a Frank Yablon's presentation, a Brian De Palma film, The Fury. An experience in terror and suspense. Rated R, under 17, not admitted without parent. this ancient literature in the form of biblical tomes tells the truth about human origins, history, and what exactly are these beings that visit us. Even though through artwork over the years, and this is just how I'm understanding it, that it was interpreted as an archaic perspective of what angels, demons, even fire from the heavens, all that stuff, you know, the wheel was interpreted differently because that's the only thing that humans saw back then. But in reality, it was always these things that we're seeing now, um, you know, these craft, the beings that come out, the grays, aliens that are controlling them. I'm just trying to get a handle on the full perspective. And I've had, I, I've heard some of this before. Uh, but I just think for some of the people that this might be new to them because it's so basic when they hear about a UFO, it's simple. You know, this could just be technologically advanced beings from another planet. We don't consider that they're from other dimensions or that they're attached to our much deeper history, our ancient history that we've yet to really fully understand. Uh, am I on the right track? You're on the right track. And let me kind of really do a segue here. Sure into pseudo-modern history from the 1960s onward. Um, J. Ellen Hynek and Jacques Vallée, two of the, um, two of the people who uh, formed what we now call the Close Encounters classification, both stated, and these were agnostic scientists, uh, they neither believed in God or disbelieved in God. But their statement was that these craft and beings were not extraterrestrial as what was said, but that they believed that they were uh, extra-dimensional and that they fell into the category of what the ancients uh, used to call demonic. Wow. I wanted to bring that up for clarification. Now, people might think, okay, well, he's talking about stuff, you know, um, dealing with the past and dealing with uh, Bible history and, and ancient stories. But when you got two of the founders of, mo- of the modern UFO movement, stating that they don't believe that they're extraterrestrial, but that they're spiritual in nature and and demonic. And I would say, listen to what they have to say. But back to what I was saying, though. We're going to get into the realms right now about the Nephilim or the Raphael. And again, yeah, no, I'm, I'm understanding the info and uh, please continue. But then I would like to get back to, I'm glad this foundation was laid because now, now the audience knows 
how you perceive these things and they it'll help them understand further your own personal experience. So please continue. Well, it says in the Bible in Genesis 6 that uh, the sons of man, which were the angels, it's another statement for the angels, came down to earth and saw and looked at uh, human women and saw that they were beautiful and lusted after them and started to procreate with them, creating renowned men of old. Those were called the Nephilim, giants, uh, Gianticus and all, were looking at the fact that there were uh, hybrids between angelic beings and humans, even back millennial, millennium ago. These stories deal with the abduction phenomenon now because even Christ stated in the New Testament when people ask him, how shall we know when you will return? And he goes, as in the days of Noah, shall it be when when the Son of Man returns? What happened in the days of Noah? There was a great flood. The real reason for the flood, Christopher, had to do with Yahweh cleansing the earth of these genetic hybrids, of these Nephilim, and then restarting humanity from scratch. And that's what occurred and and what we're seeing right now in modern-day abduction phenomenon or experiences is that we're looking at the same genetic manipulation happening now again that happened almost 10,000 years ago when man first stepped foot on the earth. So if we're looking at it from that perspective, we're looking now at demonic entities that are trying to pollute the gene pool again which they believe, and even Lucifer believes, that when the Son of Man returns, there won't be a true living uh, member of man or humankind left. And how are been- they attempting to do this? Is it through the technology that's being introduced, uh, perspectives? Well, even they're using genetic engineering. It so in other words, this it's interesting because again, like if you, it really requires an open mind and a, and a higher level of intelligence to completely understand this theory. And so I, I'm so interested in this. And it sometimes when I hear these things, they make more sense to the ancient tomes and to our existence than the very narrow, narrowed down perspective that we were taught that it's simplified. So in other words, these creatures or these beings are still affecting us and they're doing it with technology and they're deceiving us. And are some of them in human form? Here's the one thing I want to make a point about the angels. The angelic beings have can morph. They can take on different forms. One of those forms is not directly human, but human-like. They have the image of being a human, but they're still an angelic being. So there are differences between their angel, uh, their, um, I guess the best way to put it is they're human, but they're not human. You see differences like the eyes, for example, might be totally black. Would you say that all of the supernatural that we've learned of through fiction or even legend in one way or another is or was real? Well, you could say yes and no. I mean, actually, it would 
the way that the ancient people would understand it might be different than what we would perceive in our modern understanding. Like, for example, in Ezekiel, where, where it had the story about the wheel within the wheel. And that angels were coming out of it. Could easily be either a Stargate technology or a landing craft. Wow. And again, when you look at it in that way, at that time, there was no true human technology to speak of. So they were just perceiving it as they did. And that's when all of these things were written. However, if people are seeing these things now, the common thing would be, or at least in the last 100 years or so, uh, they would see it as advanced beings from another physical world. Now, we're starting to think about interdimensional travel and combining definitions from old, these biblical tomes and ancient perspectives, and trying to make sense of them through our current perspective. Am I uh, saying it right? Pretty good. It deals with how we look at, at things through the lens of our own reality and what we um, have experience with. The ancients did not have the, da the data points or the data set to be able to understand what they were looking at. Here's another thing I want to throw at everybody here, a little zinger here. <laughs> It is my opinion that before the Great Flood, that because of the interaction of the uh, what they call the ancient ones, the old ones, or even the demonic forces interacting with humankind, that I believe that we had an advanced existing technology prior to the Flood. And that the Flood got rid of it. Resetting the resetting time as we know it, and that that ancient knowledge has been forgotten more than likely intentionally by humanity over the last 10,000 years. For example, we could go, and I'm not going to try to go into it right now, but look at the multiple, multiple pyr pyramidal structures around the world. The United States, China, Egypt, parts of the uh, e uh, Eastern Europe, all the all around the world, we we're seeing and also don't forget about South America as well, the Incas and Aztecs. I believe that there, and also in Japan, I forgot about that, the, there's an underwater complex there. But if we're looking at it from the larger perspective, we had a pre-existing advanced techn technological uh, society before it was wiped out and wiped away from the uh, public record. Do you believe in, let's say, 50 to 100 years from now, much more of this will be revealed and confirmed? Because it's independent researchers like yourself that have really adhered to this over the years, whereas the governments who give everyone permission to think <laughs> uh, dismiss these things, yet they must have known a lot of this too, no? Well, let's go into secret societies right now. Uh, everybody wants to talk about the quote-unquote Illuminati. But we had other secret societies predating the Illuminati. One of the more notorious ones is the uh, Masonic Order. And they had uh, what they called um, information they gleaned from the mystery schools. And when you become members of these occultic groups, you're, uh, and you get, you raise into, into the higher levels in each of these groups, you're given the keys to access this hidden knowledge, this occult esoteric knowledge. 
And the thing is, we know about it. Some of what we're doing right now, even in the classified world, dealing with black operations and black budget projects, comes strictly from the research that's been done into these esoteric scientific um okay i can't think of the word right now but um procedures or processes that um were obtained by the ancients one example of that in modern history is the nazi party in world war ii Prior to the prior to Germany getting into World War II, Hitler sent a group of archaeologists and scientists around the world to find ancient artifacts that they believe held occultic power. They went to Tibet, they went to parts of China, they went down to the Middle East. They found reportedly the dagger that was used to pierce um, Yahweh or Jesus' side as he was being crucified on the cross. Uh, the spear of destiny is what they call it. And they believe that these particular items have power. And they believe that they and the tool, the Thule and the Varel societies which were a major influence on the Nazi party and on uh, Himmler and on um, Adolf Hitler as well as well as well as other members of the SS. Um, they believed that they were channeling information from what they called demonic extraterrestrial sources to build their tool or thule and varel craft. Amazing. See, again, these this information has been around for quite some time, but I think only certain pockets of of interest took it seriously enough to go further into the whatever information they could find. And it seems like these days now people are looking into it knowing your perspective. And I'm sure that formed over the years, but you, that must have been the foundation to set you forward now. Were there more experiences, and when did the next experience occur, if there were? Well, well, we'll have to get into this on, an, on, on another chapter, but because I was being, I'm directly connected and my story is to uh, Operation Looking Glass explains why there were there was an overreaching th issue with um, UFO interaction phenomenon in my life. And uh, I'll just wet the whistle of the audience right now and tell them that if... <laughs> If you don't know anything about Operation Looking Glass, look it up. Read on Looking Glass. You'll see that Looking Glass, they were able to project multiple future scenarios using a multiverse model where they could see potential future events occurring in real time. In every one of those particular readings from the uh, Looking Glass, a late friend of mine, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Billy Rose, who was the original technician on Looking Glass, told me that my name came up in every one of those scenarios. Why do I bring that up now? Because you ask a question about the interactions I've had with UFOs since. Those are counterplayed with uh, um, connections that I've had with the U.S. military intelligence community. And goes back to the uh, 
issues that we're going to be discussing in a in, a, in a, another episode dealing with the Montauk issue. But there's more at play with that because it deals with what we're talking about today. So I will say to everybody what we're speaking about today is a precursor. Because it all deals with looking glass and that these particular entities, as Billy told me, the Roswell UFO was not an extraterrestrial craft, but a time machine. And reportedly these entities, from what Billy believed, were from the future traveling back in time. What he told me is in uh, Looking Glass, uh, he told me that at least in uh, 12 different scenarios that my name and likeness came up. And prior to that, Billy wanted to meet me. For And I never knew the guy before then. We became quick friends afterwards. But he told me that I would have a geopolitical thing that I'm suppo supposed to be doing. So how does that work with the UFO scenario? If these beings are either A, interdimensional, or B, time travelers from uh, either one or more of the multiverse uh, dimensions that we're talking about, even our current one, then what they're doing is that they already have this baseline information at their time, Christopher. They're traveling back to observe the people that are mentioned in these reports. And remember, with Looking Glass, it's not what you call a written report. It's a 3D holographic image, a recording of potential future events. That is the record. And if, you, if you're a, quote, time-traveling alien, or even an interdimensional alien that knows, even though, you're, even though demons or daemons are not um, omnipresent like Yahweh is, but they would know what potential future events may transpire. Put yourself in these beings' shoes. Wouldn't you want to see whether or not this guy is going to complete the mission that he was destined to do? Wouldn't your curiosity compel you to want to go look at this man and say, and they have been observing me since I was a boy, a young Boy, more recently, and let me get to the point here. So I, I, you know, in the 2000s, when I lived in Odessa, Texas, I was riding in the car with my, my oldest sister. And I looked at an oil derrick, of all things. Thought I saw a helicopter hovering above that oil derrick right above it. And I pointed it out to my sister because I, I'm wondering, what's that helicopter doing? And as I tried to point it out to her, the thing literally right there vanished. And went poof and it was gone. It was just not there. And then I didn't tell my sister anything about it. I said, okay. And about 13 years later, I lived in Bozeman, Montana. I was riding a public bus. It was snowing that day, so we had some gray white clouds, and I was kind of interested in looking at the, you know, the basic view of what the clouds lo look like, and I thought they were beautiful. But then, for some unknown reason, I fixated on one point, and I don't know why I was doing it, but I did. And as I fixated and kept looking at that one point, an image of a top hat shaped craft 
came into view and then zipped off and left. In other words, I have a psychic ability, Chris, to be able to interact with these entities. There must have been another incident after the abduction at the trailer house. What, uh, what was that? What was your next experience? Because you must have had a head full of dreams, ideas, fascination, uh, recollecting the whole thing. And I, and I appreciate all of the previous explanations. They're, they're going to lend to the understanding of perhaps that you're, you're different. But what was the next profound experience specifically? Well, I already had a knowledge about UFOs prior to my experience. So that in of itself is um, something that, you know, I wouldn't say that it reshaped me. But, you know, I was a student of it for years, you know, before then. But what I did want to share real quickly is that I've taken that Zener or Zyner test. I forget what it's called, right. but it's the, the cards, yeah. the card test. And generally you're going to, out of 45, randomly make one. It's when you either fail all of them or make all of them that it's a statistical anomaly. And when I took the test, I failed them all. They went back and they saw that I actually um, was able to guess the cards 10 ahead in the sequence. In other words, I can see into the future. The strange thing about what happened is that afterwards is that that ability was enhanced after that um, UFO interaction. I got to a point, and I hate to use the occultic term on it, but you've heard the term, the mind's eye. Yes, I have. I have. I was able to see future events, not in, only in my life, but in the life of other people that I was yet to meet. In other words, I was like, how should I put it? I hate to use the term possessing their body or seeing through their mind's eye in real time as to what they were going or going to be uh, doing in the future. Primary example of that one was when a friend of mine had been, uh, he, had, he was an alcoholic. He had an issue with alcoholism. Years before I ever met him, I had a vision where I walked out of a uh, RV to notice that the owner of the property had unplugged the uh, power source and shut the power off to the RV I came out of. Well, that never happened to me. It did years later happen to this friend of mine, exactly the way I had dreamt it. What I'm saying is whatever occurred uh, after that incident in Conroe gave me, how should I put it, enhanced abilities. But here's the other thing. I'm a meta genius. My specific area of expertise is in gravity modification. I see, I see designs of systems in my head in mental sim, simulations that come to me out of the ether. I then apply my knowledge of science behind that to uh, develop and, and to simulate these designs so that way they can be built. And with you know, we haven't talked about it, but what is it that you do um, in life as a profession? Well, currently I'm, an, I'm a writer. The science stuff is really on the side, but I'm a, I'm a noted expert in the field of gravity modification. There, so there weren't any experiences until much later, you know, profound ones like the one that happened when you were a kid. But then you started on a plane of self-discovery. 
taking the the Zener card tests, um, testing your psychic abilities, uh, diving into technology, you know, um, applying your uh, your IQ to a variety of things. And you started to realize that maybe you were of heightened abilities in comparison to many other people. Well, I know that. And not only do I know that, but contacts that I have currently in the U.S. intelligence community were made because they knew I had these abilities. One particular individual, Dr. Jack Serfati, which I think if you have, if you've heard of him, have you not? If I'm thinking of the right person, I have, yeah. Well, Jack contacted me, and I have epilepsy. And I, I was going to join the Air Force, and the day I was going to join, I had 13 grand mal seizures. And that ended my, you know, aspirations to become a uh, Air Force pilot, then later on a uh, NASA astronaut. I told Jack about it, and he said your um, epilepsy was caused by an abduction. And I never told him, uh, you know, about what happened in 78 or even since. Oh, yeah, you let me tell you about an incident that happened in 1999. Before I forget, I was living in an apartment in Universal City, Texas, which is where the former Randolph Air Force Base is located. I was in a in a um, studio apartment, and at night I was in between REM sleep and, and awake, and then a bright light came up into the room. It's like it... The uh, wall unzipped, this blinding light came out, and these creatures came out of the blinding light. Well, a audible male voice said, go back from whence you came. It was an audible and very stern voice. As soon as that voice was made, these creatures converged and went back into that thing uh, into that light, and then the light zipped up, and the wall reappeared. The creatures that came out were grays. So that's one thing if you were wondering about what happened between 1978 to 1999-2000. What do you think the voice was? God. What is God? Or Yahweh. How should I put it? You know, people look at it from the uh, perspective of the all-knowing, all-seeing entity. Right. However, and hold one moment, please. Sure. However, if you look at it from a, st- a scientific standpoint, the Bible says God is a omnipresent creator, which means he's interdimensional. I believe he is the essence of knowledge and intelligence manifest into a being. If you understand where I'm going with this. I do. I do. You know, it's obviously something we all wonder about. Um, It's so complicated. It really is. It's a, it's a, it's an, bottomless pit of a conversation that you could just keep diving into until it's somewhat simplified for the human brain to understand. Even the most intelligent one probably couldn't grasp exactly what all this is. And maybe we're not meant to. Well, let me bring up something for you, Christopher. Sure. God thought in in Genesis. God thought and spoken to existence, the very universe you and I are a part of. The whole point is, it was all number one intention, and with the and with the intention came the action. 
And then from the action, the response, which was and is the creation of what we call our universe itself. And, and, and that is a fascinating uh, idea and possibility of our existence. And I always wondered throughout that, in what world does God, as we call this entity, exist? I would not see in a world per se. How do you can't fit God in a box? Right. That's why I mean it's just such a complicated thing to understand. Uh, at least in this in this form, you know, you'd have to imagine and really think about it. But just going further in your history, your personal history, you as a human being on this planet. Um, you had a further abduction experience. And this is while, and the, and the experience that you just explained to me was while you were laying in bed? Correct. And here's the interesting part. That audible voice commanded them to leave. And they left immediately. They turned around, went back, and never molested me again. And these were the gray aliens. Correct. Wow. There were, there were at least between 12 and 16 of them that started coming out into my uh, apartment before they were ordered back. Now, so to, to go, okay, so, and again, um, wow. I mean, it's such a profound experience. So just to kind of sum this up at the end of uh, to summarize this at the, at the end of this chapter that I have to close soon. So I just wanted to uh, clarify that all in all, your experience was that you grew up with stories uh, of UFOs in culture. Then you had your own experience. Then slowly over the years, you started to realize that you had these heightened abilities and then more happened and it was you know it was grotesque it was um it was violation you know you were being abducted but you felt that maybe something or you perceive it or you believe that something divine and you know intervened and stopped this and that you weren't visited again until later which is what we're going to explore in the next chapter until later where worse things happened. You were part of a government project uh, that I had looked into for many years and made you know documentaries and TV shows about the Montauk project. Am I correct on this? Well, let me change that because the Montauk issue actually happened before. It happened before the UFO abduction. Wow. Okay. See, it this happened is an when I was seven years old. Okay, so if you can give me a brief explanation, just that eventually is going to lead us into that next chapter, because this is a great note to end on, that I did not know it happened before the abduction experience. At what point did you realize that you were in a secret government project before your abduction experience? Well, it all started about uh, in 1975 when I was living in Missoula, Montana and was a part of a CIA-sponsored uh, project looking for gifted children. And I happened to be one that they were looking into. And it turns out that the people who did the Zener test on me, there were three of them. Two of them, one of them was Russell Targ, and the other one was Dr. Hal Putoff, and a third man who, uh, was, who did the test directly himself. Not only that, but they ran IQ tests on me. They were doing other things other than the Zener test. And throughout... You know, and after that, they invited, told my father they wanted to bring me 
to a special facility in, in Montauk Point to do uh, to further test my psychic abilities. I, I don't you know want to go into too much detail as to what happened, but needless to say, they were looking for kids who were gifted with gifted intelligence that had psychic abilities that they could uh, uh, capitalize on. And at the time, and I'll further explain what happened during the next episode, but they, when they were doing the experiments on me uh, at Montauk, my father ordered them to let me go after 14 hours. Afterwards, we ran across the country. My father ordered my older sisters uh, and told them that you, if Rick is ever asked to jump in a car or if anyone tries to pull Rick into a car, you grab him. Do not walk. Run home. He knew that at that point that they were planning on potentially um, abducting me and taking me to further enhance my abilities so I could serve the government. One example of what they were trying to do to me but never accomplished. Have you ever heard of the uh, movie, uh, Brian De Palma movie, The Fury? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm, uh, very familiar with it. The Fury was based on that particular program that they were trying to get me into. Wow. And the ironic part is we would run across the country, not stay in one place any longer than six months at a time. But every single school, a CIA tester would come in and still test my... um, IQ and cognitive abilities. They were keeping tabs on me throughout that whole thing. And I can explain more about what happened during that time. I've had incidences where I've had black helicopters, even as as an adult, um, watching me. You know, they weren't doing anything wrong, but what they were doing was that they were making sure nobody would hurt me. They were protecting me. And there there were hundreds of incidences where that occurred. Welcome back to Off to the Witch. I'm your host, Christopher Garitano, and I want to thank you for joining the conversation tonight. There's more to come with Richard Price as his story gets even more elaborate and fantastic. I'm open to hear the rest of his tale, as I hope all of you are as well. We'll continue with Richard in a couple of weeks. Next week, we look at a possible paranormal conspiracy and talk to an adventurer who has spent her entire life searching the unknown. Until our next visit, Try to enjoy the daylight.